I sometimes think I live in a cyberpunk novel, right? High tech, low life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and the criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. This episode is for September 3rd, 2020. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. we got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, my conversation with Max Heinemeyer from Darktrace. He's going to be sharing with us some of the threats that he and his team have been tracking throughout the onset and spread of COVID-19. Have you ever been to security training? We have. What's it been like for you? If you're like us, ladies and gentlemen, it's the annual compliance drill, a few hours of PowerPoint in the staff break room. Refreshments in the form of sugary donuts and tepid coffee are sometimes provided, but a little bit of your soul seems to die every time the trainer says, Next slide. Well, okay, we exaggerate, but you know what we mean. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before, who have a different way of training. All right, Joe, uh, before we get to our stories, we've got a little bit of a quick follow-up here. A recent show, you and I were talking about people having their Facebook accounts cloned, and uh, I was saying it had happened to me. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we got a, a kind note over on Twitter from someone who goes by the name The Computrix, at The Computrix. And this person said that uh, people can slow down Facebook cloners by hiding their friends list. It's something I recommend to everyone. It's under Friends, Manage, Edit Privacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a good idea. You go in there and so the general public can't see your friends list. You can actually make it so that only you can see your friends list, which seems like a good idea. It does. It does seem like a good idea. In fact, I do this, actually. What the biggest issue is here is that a lot of people do not do this. Yeah. (laughs) So they're the ones at risk of being cloned. And the compute tricks here is absolutely correct. This is a great way to stop your account from being cloned effectively. Someone can yeah. still clone your account, but they will not be able to address your friends because they won't know who they are. Right, right. So it may make your account less valuable, so they'll move on to someone else. Right. And then that other person might be one of your friends and you might show up in their friend list. And I think there's also a setting on Facebook that says, don't show me in other people's friends lists. Uh, that mm. that might be a setting. I don't know. I haven't looked at this. I try to stay off Facebook as much as possible. Like I've said before, I would totally close it down if I didn't have all the communication with so many people on that platform. But this is good advice, I think. Yeah, I would agree. Yep, absolutely. Also, let me give a little follow-up on your Instagram cloner. I said we'd follow this as as it goes on. Nothing has happened with that yet. Hmm. So I checked yesterday, no communication from the person who cloned your account. Hmm. All right, well, let's move on to our stories. Uh, I'm going to kick things off for us this week. Uh, This is a story from the Cyber News website written by Bernard Meyer. Uh, It's titled, Boomer Outsmarts Hackers, Kiss Your Cash Goodbye. (laughs) Uh, And uh, this is uh, all happening over in the U.K., Uh, And I'm pretty sure you're going to get a kick out of this, Joe, because I know you love it when the good guys pull one over on the bad guys. I do, yes. (laughs) So this is a story of a 73-year-old gentleman from North Yorkshire who uh, was able to sort of turn the tables on some hackers who were trying to steal thousands of pounds. You know, Joe, pounds, that's what they call money over in the UK. That's right. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like dollars, but <laughs> Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he got reached out to on Facebook from an acquaintance of his who asked if he could help with a transaction online. He said he was buying a camera and he was having trouble with his PayPal account and asked uh, this gentleman if he could help him basically with the money. Uh-huh. And this guy said, uh, he wanted to be helpful. He said, okay, I'll help you with that. And then rapid fire, five payments came in via PayPal to this guy's PayPal account. Now, two of the five payments were blocked, but the three remaining payments, each one which was uh, for 690 pounds, So we're not talking about insignificant money here. This is the potential victim is receiving payments from somebody. Correct. Right. So the first thing that happens is the bad guys send this person some money. Okay. And not an insignificant amount. No, he receives it in his PayPal account. And the scammer asks him to then transfer it to a different bank account. Okay. So they're asking him to be the middleman in here. 
right uh, un, under the the guise of saying that they're just having trouble using their PayPal account. Plausible, right? So far, plausible. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but you if know. you're having trouble using your PayPal account, how are you sending me money via PayPal? An excellent question, Joe. An excellent <laughs> question. <laughs> well, and I, we, but you know what? I don't think it's the person who's sending the money via PayPal. I think it's the person who's maybe buying the camera or this alleged friend is trying to have a, a transaction with. Okay. Right. So you're getting paid by a buyer of something, and then you're going to take that money you got and you're going to send that on to your friend. Okay. That's what that seems to me like that's what's happening here. So okay. or what they're claiming is happening here. Of course, it's all it's all a big scam. Right. So the person who sent him the money starts uh, pressuring him to transfer the money to a different account. Uh, he goes and tries to do it and uh, his bank flags it and recognizes that it's a scam. Right. And won't do the transfer. The scammer gets more and more agitated, asks him to call the bank and try to transfer the money. And at this point, this gentleman thinks that there's something up. He, he thinks it's, yep. his suspicions have been raised. Yes. When your bank flags a transaction, that's a little bit of a tell. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So he tries to get his uh, acquaintance to, uh, on the phone. He tries to get him on the phone. He says, sure. let's talk about this person to person. Yeah, absolutely. Just Good a idea. Great idea, right? And the uh, alleged acquaintance refuses to do so. Says, no, no, I'm at work. Uh, I can't call you right now. And the gentleman being scammed replies and said, well, why don't you take a bathroom break and call me while you're you know, out, out on a bathroom break? I just need some confirmation. Confirmation never came. And so this gentleman uh, decided to uh, just keep the money. <laughs> but here's what happened next. Right. Uh, it turns out that via PayPal, you can reverse a transaction. Right. So one of the payments was reversed. Basically, the bad guys clawed back one of the 690-pound transactions. And a few days later, they tried to reverse another transaction. But uh, this gentleman has refused to return the money to PayPal. And he's saying to PayPal, I'm not giving you this money back until you can prove to me that these were real people, not scammers. Right. So I'm guessing what happened was is that this gentleman had a negative balance in his PayPal account, right? PayPal returned the money. I can't claim expertise on how PayPal works, but you, you can link your PayPal account to a bank account. And I believe you have to link your PayPal account to a bank account if I'm not... Uh, I don't know that you have to, but I mean, you can start a PayPal account, but the, you can put money in with a credit card as well. But okay. yes, you can link it to your bank account and you can move money from your PayPal account to your bank account. Right. So to sort of look at this at a higher level. So the scam here is that the bad guys target a victim, right? They right. ask for their help. They send them money. The victim gets the money. The victim then transfers the money to the bank account of the scammers. And then the scammers claw the money back from PayPal, the original money that they sent, so the person in the middle, the victim, ends up being out all of that money because right. the money that they thought they had in their account to send to the scammers gets clawed back. And, and so now they're out that money. Yeah. That's yeah. how the scam works. That's how the scam works. So it's kind of almost like a check floating scam. Yeah. But in this case, uh, this gentleman who uh, sounds to me might be a little bit cranky. Uh, <laughs> My so, kind of guy. Like, yeah, <laughs> decided, decided that he is not sending the money back you know, until PayPal proves to him that this is a real person and not a scammer, that he is not going to return the money. Now, I don't know what actual legal case he has against PayPal, what, what agreements he made when he signed up for PayPal, what ability PayPal has to claw this money back from him or or whatever. That I don't know about that, but... Uh, I have to say, uh, my hat's off to him for yep. <laughs> for, for the effort anyway, yes, right? <laughs> it looks like he didn't send any money out, right? So he's he's not out any money. Correct, right. He's grabbed some money from the bad guys. Right. And he's he's refusing to return it. Yeah, uh, good. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to play out in England. In, in the UK, I think there's a lot of consumer protection law that he might just get away with this. This might be yeah. fine, you know? Yeah. Somebody tried to scam you when they lost 650 pounds? Too bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, well, that is my story this week. What do you have for us, Joe? Dave, this week I want to talk about a report out from Kaspersky's cyber threat research organization called mm. SecureList. 
and they have the 2020 quarter two spam and phishing report. And we'll put a link in the show notes and you should take a look at this report. It's an interesting report with lots of data and statistics, but here are some key points. One of the first things that stands out to me in this report is that scammers are targeting smaller companies. Now, you know, I have the ability to wildly speculate and often do, (laughs) <laughs> but I think this is because smaller companies are actually turning out now to be better targets for these scammers because they don't have the huge budgets that large companies do. And while the payoffs may not be as large as if you target a large company, they are still there. And if you can scam a small company out of 600 to to $1,000, that is a good day for a scammer. Mm-hmm. Right? They are imitating email messages and websites of companies whose products or services these smaller companies may be using. And a pretext is essentially like a cover story, you know, like Mm. what you're going to tell people all about as your introduction to whatever you're scamming them with. But the main pretext for these scammers is a prompt to get the target to enter their login information for their email account to view an online catalog that uh, Mm. is only available once you log in. They're obviously going after these smaller businesses where people might be less technically sophisticated and much more focused on what they do. Now, if you think about a small business, Dave, working in a small business is not like working in a big business. When you work (laughs) in a large business, you have one or two tasks that you take care of. But when you work at a small business, you have to carry a lot of the small business load, right? Yep. You're going to have to do a lot more things. And that may distract you from things. So if you're an office manager, you may very well do things like Take the trash out when the trash gets full. Oh, yeah. Right? That might have to happen. Uh, You know, the trash is full, and you may or may not even have housekeeping services coming in at night. Yep. Somebody has to do it. I've done all this. I've I've been a small business owner, and I have been there, my friend. Absolutely. I've worked for small businesses. I really enjoy working for small businesses because it's it's a nice, close-knit group, and it's uh, everybody is much more invested, I think. But- one of the things is you are more dispersed with your attention. Thus, I think you're a little more vulnerable yeah. to these kind of attacks. Yeah, and also, uh, I think to your point, that you're less likely to have full-time staff who are paying attention to these sorts of security issues. Correct. Right? Chances are you've outsourced this to someone or you're using some sort of big service provider. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it just means that the odds of having an extra set of eyes or a dedicated set of eyes on this are lower for a small organization. That's absolutely correct, Dave. Another point that jumped out to me is that these fishers are taking advantage of the pandemic and they're actually going after people with a few hooks for phishing. One is package delivery notices, right? They're posing as courier delivery service employees and sending out emails that packages couldn't be delivered because of failure to pay the shipping. So they're just Hmm. trying to scam people out of the shipping fees. They're sending phishing emails out, pretending to be banks and offering loans and such for COVID-19 related needs. And they're also sending out tax refund notifications in the same vein. But here is the most insidious and distinctly evil way that they're exploiting the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. They are sending fake messages from HR saying that you've been fired or terminated because of the pandemic and that the attachment, which is just a malicious attachment, is a way for you to request two months of severance pay. So go Uh. fill out the attachment and you'll get your severance package. And of course, the attachment's malicious. Um, You know, this is despicable, of course. We've seen much worse things from these guys before, but I think this is pretty low. Yeah. Short-circuiting your emotions there by... by Right, exactly. ...coming out of nowhere and saying you've been fired due to the pandemic. So now you're in a a state of panic or distress or who knows what. But then setting the hook by saying, well, here's the good news. We're going to pay you for two months. All you need to do is... Download this this attachment. (laughs) Right, exactly. Open up, double click on this attachment. And then they've got you. Take a look at this article. It's a good article. There are tons of great stats and charts in this article if you're into that sort of thing, and I am. So Mm -hmm. I imagine that most of our listeners are as well. Go click on the link in the show notes. Take a look at it. Lots of interesting stuff. All right, very good. Well, Joe, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. Our catch of the day comes from a listener, Bob... Bob received an email that reads like this. Hi, dear. Thank God that you and your families are safe, healthy, and in good spirits. My name is Eddie Zillin. I'm from Ohio and attended high school senior in Cleveland. First of all, I want to admit that I was a little worried whether you would answer my request for a good relationship or not. 
In the recent past, I also tried a couple of times to create conversation on the email or phone, but I don't want to feel hurt and have rejected my feelings toward you. I'm looking for a serious relationship. I hope that this time I was lucky and I don't want to waste yours and my time. I want you to honestly admit to me if you are interested. Please be sincere with me. I was already badly wounded five years ago and I don't want to be hurt again. Then my woman betrayed me. He cheated on me with another man not long before we were supposed to get married. It seemed to me that my world had collapsed and I could never trust a woman again. But time heals. And now i found the strength to believe in love again. I did a lot in my past relationships to ensure that my woman was happy, but he did not appreciate my care and all the luxury life and expensive gifts – cars. I realized that all three years of our relationship, I found out she was cheating on me with my best friend, Tom. But at the same time, I never received true love and care. After much thought, I decided to try to look for happiness and I'm ready to take care of you, love you, and make you happy. I think that each of us has the right to happiness, right? And who will build happiness for us if we ourselves do not do it with our own hands? Maybe everything that I write to you right now is not at all interesting for you, but I consider it very important to explain to you at the very beginning of our communication about what kind of relationship I'm looking for and why I'm looking for these relationships. My goal is to find the right woman with whom I can build a serious relationship and be happy together. I believe I have a lot to tell you, but I have to stop now until I receive your kind response. Thanks so much, Eddie Zillin, CEO, Investor, in cryptocurrencies. <laughs> My favorite part is that he talks about his uh, previous woman, but yeah. doesn't use the proper pronoun until like two thirds of the way through the article. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, there's a little bit of gender confusion throughout here. So, yeah, I, and, yeah. I mean, this is obviously just terrible English. And I don't believe this guy's name is Eddie Zillin. <laughs> you think so? I don't think, think I don't think this person is from Ohio and I don't yeah. think they attended high school senior in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Joe, nothing gets by you. I, right. I think you're yeah. right. <laughs> I'm a little dubious you're right. as Eddie Zillman fellow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh I think we uh, pretty straightforward what's going on here. This is your standard run of the mill romance scam. Right. It's interesting that they sent it to uh to Bob. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that Eddie's yeah. out there looking for a woman and sent it to a man. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, probably what happened here is Eddie has a, the, Eddie, and with air quotes, you can't see me because this is a podcast, but this person has a big list of email addresses and they just composed this and sent it out to everybody. Yeah. And yeah. Bob was good enough to send it to us. Thank you, Bob. If you get something like this, please send this to us. We love reading them on the air. Yes, we do. All right. Well, that is our catch of the day. And now back to that question we asked earlier about training. Our sponsors at Know Before want to spring you from that break room with new school security awareness training. They've got the world's largest security awareness training library, and its content is always fresh. Know Before delivers interactive, engaging training on demand. It's done through the browser and supplemented with frequent simulated social engineering attacks by email, phone, and text. Pick your categories to suit your business, Operate internationally? Know Before delivers convincing, real-world proven templates in 24 languages. And wherever you are, be sure to stay on top of the latest news and information to protect your organization with Know Before's weekly Cyber Heist News. We read it, and we think you'll find it valuable, too. Sign up for Cyber Heist News at knowbefore.com slash news. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash news. All right, Joe. So I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Max Heinemeyer from a company called Darktrace, a security company. Uh, and he and his team have been tracking uh, some things from the onset and spread of COVID. And Max joins us to share some of the things that they've been following. Here's my conversation with Max Heinemeyer. It's an interesting threat landscape these days. It's evolving rapidly, as surely everybody in cyber will attest. 
and it's getting more furious by the minute. We've seen such a huge increase in what we call fearware, spear phishing, phishing, scamming, spoofed emails that piggyback off the corona crisis. It's not only the phishing and the social engineering, there's also a lot happening in the old school, almost like early 2000 remote code execution exploits against internet facing infrastructure. But overall, it's just getting worse and worse, I would say. Can you take us through some of the specific things that you're tracking? I mean, some of these things are, are new to me. For example, I'm, I'm not familiar with the term dynamite phishing. What, what's going on with that? So dynamite phishing is something the Emotet botnet introduced to the broader threat landscape, I think, two years ago or something. It's basically when a threat actor steals the inbox emails from hacked victims to use them later on for further infections. And we know this, right? We know that threat actors use compromised inboxes to send more scam emails and phishing emails. But the interesting part here is that they take existing email chains that exist between legitimate senders and recipients and they send these off and add a little bit at the end, like, hey, see attached or thanks for talking. Look at the attached document. And that normally is malware. So the dynamite bit is that it uses existing legitimate email conversations to lure the victims into clicking on either phishing links or opening malicious attachments. Right. So this is an established conversation that I may have had with a colleague or a coworker. So there's no reason for either me or the technology I may have protecting myself to suspect that there's anything going wrong here. Exactly. It's really difficult for humans and also for machines to identify this, especially for machines. If it's an existing trusted relationship between two entities that have communicated before, it can be incredibly difficult to prevent this. And we expect this to be taken further in the near future as well by the incorporation of potentially malicious machine learning in some form. Now, I know you and your team have been doing a lot of work with artificial intelligence and and some of the ways that that can be used for social engineering. Can you take us through some of the things that you're working on? Oh, absolutely. I love talking about this. (laughs) So why do we look into what we call offensive AI? So using machine learning in various forms to conduct cyber attacks. Well, At Darktrace, we do all things AI and machine learning to defend people, to defend customers, defend employees. And as part of that, we introduced our email solution that uses unsupervised machine learning to detect anomalies and weird communication patterns and spot never seen before spear phishing emails, CFO fraud, scams, and all these things. But to test that system, we wanted to push boundaries a bit and see how far we can go. So we started looking into offensive AI to auto-create spear phishing emails. And I'm more than happy to expand on this. I think it's very exciting. And we actually think that, that some threat does also piggybacking off of this and looking into similar techniques. Yeah, well, let's go into it. What sorts of things are you working on? So if you think about creating spear phishing emails, normally what you go through, and I used to be a pen tester, I still conduct pen tests and I've been doing it for 10 years now. Normally, you, of course, will get your victims, either the organization or the individuals. You understand their social media profiles, their job position, their bios, their CV, that's online, their hobbies, the things they talk about, where they live. So it's basic social engineering 101, right? Researching your victims and doing all these things. And we thought, why can't we automate this? Why do we have to do all of these things manually? And why can't we push the boundaries a bit? So instead of doing these laborious and very manual intense tasks ourselves. We created some machine learning bits and pieces to automate that. So instead of, you know, doing all the legwork yourself and going to social media, creating LinkedIn profiles, understanding situations and topics and all these things, we use some machine learning of various forms, some supervised and some unsupervised to basically go through social media, understand profiles, understand job positions, understand topics that people talk about, and then drive it further. Not just understand these things, but understand the topics they talk about, the positions they're in, the hierarchy levels of organizations, and then auto-create, based on that information automatically gathered, suggestions for spear phishing attachments and emails. So all the legwork, all the boring tasks almost that you have to do as a social engineer, we basically automate it to the furthest degree possible, we think. That's just a prototype, and we used it for internal testing to test our own systems, but we were astonished how effective it is. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that's kind of a a chilling possibility to think about, that if I'm a social engineer, uh, I can have this, uh, I suppose, sort of a a cheat sheet given to me that that gives me the the recommended ways to go at spear phishing someone. 
Exactly. Everything you need to do basically is point the tool at a victim organization. And a few minutes later, you're presented with directed spear phishing emails, the victims being spoofed, the attachments are there, topics they talk about on social media are selected and piggybacked on. It's very powerful. We have not open sourced it and probably won't do it because it's quite <laughs> dangerous, obviously. But if folks want to get an idea and a taster, there's an open source tool out there which does the same thing for spear tweeting. It's called snap underscore R, snap R. And it's a prototype from, I think, two years ago or something. Really interesting. It does a few of those things I mentioned, but just based on Twitter, understand conversations, natural language processing, and auto-create spear phishing tweets. Are there any practical defenses against these sorts of things? I mean, if, if they're just gathering information that's out there in the open... Uh, I suspect this is a difficult thing to defend against. I think anything so early in the kill chain, the OSINT part, the early reconnaissance part that doesn't even touch the victims is really hard to defend against, right? I mean, we always want to defend as early as possible in the kill chain, but that's just outside of most people's possibility realm to do this. We think that the machines need to do a better job, right? Tools, vendors, email gateways. And it's very important to have security awareness programs and have so-called the human firewalls you know, best here in this podcast, right? Hmm. But we think um, from the vendor perspective and the tech perspective, we have to push the boundaries. We can't push too much responsibility, especially now that it gets harder to spot these fakes and they can be created more rapidly and at scale. Um, we can't push the res responsibility down to the humans all the time. We still have to be aware but we need to be doing a better job as the security industry. You know, here in the U.S., we've got a uh, an election coming up, sort of bearing down on us sooner than later. And something that has a lot of people concerned is the possibility of folks using deep fakes for misinformation. And I know that's an area that you and your team have been taking a look at as well. Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't even have to be a specialized AI research team to utilize these technologies for evil or for good purposes. If Folks, take a look at websites like thispersondoesnotexist.com. You can just get deepfake pictures from people that don't exist and don't flag up on any OSINT tools and use them in your spear phishing examples and similar things. So we fully believe that the problem with fake news and with disinformation campaigns will just be exacerbated with the upcoming election in the US, obviously, and other countries. But it doesn't even have to be that technology advanced, right? I sometimes think I live in a cyberpunk novel, right? <laughs> High tech, low life. <laughs> and it doesn't need deep fakes to have a successful disinformation campaign. It's certainly useful to make attribution harder and detection harder, but even with existing tools and just amplification on Twitter and other social media, botnets and troll farms, there can be a lot of damage done. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and a, and a valuable insight that I think it's very easy for us to be attracted to or maybe even distracted by these these very shiny things like deep fakes that capture the imagination. But really, those simple things, those low-level things, those phishing campaigns, those disinformation campaigns, they still work. They're still highly effective. Absolutely. And that's what we see all the time. And with Dark Trace, we're fully um, believing in that phishing is used so much by threat actors because it's low cost and high efficiency, right? It lowers the barriers to entry to many threat actors. And again, we think it's super important to use advanced defenses so we don't shift the responsibility on the poor employees who, you know, just want to do their jobs. So it's quite an important point for us to not overcomplicate things and scare people into thinking Terminator is two clicks away and it's going to hack everybody and everybody's going to use deep fakes. It's certainly a tale of our times that it's often discussed in the media, but we have to be skeptic around the latest types. And that comes from a company who does machine learning and AI, right? Right, right. Well, what are your recommendations then for folks who are looking to best protect themselves against these sort of things? What sort of advice do you have? Just a couple of things. And I always think about individual advice and organizational advice. But on the individual level, just be aware and take your best practices into action. These can be things, as everybody knows, might affect authentication, good password management, mnemonic techniques, password managers. And I've got some very paranoid friends who don't even use social media at all and say, I don't even want to appear. But keep in mind that might open you up for um, fake attacks where somebody takes over your non-existing profile because you just don't have a footprint and use that to attack other people. Mm. From the organizational perspective, I think there's a lot of interesting and great tech out there at the moment. So as an industry, we've been struggling with the traditional approach of you know predefining evil using blacklists and threat intelligence and signatures. And that's great. We still need this, absolutely. 
probably more for retrospectively finding attacks. And there's a lot of really good tech out there. For example, cloud email security supplements. Um, obviously, Darktrace provides something like this as well with anti gni email that can do a lot of the heavy lifting and prevent phishing, spear phishing, see if offer from getting through. So to boil it down, I think it's best practices that we all know, cyber hygiene topics, but also looking a bit ahead and using great evolving technology to your best purposes. We often think about paradigm changes and why all this offensive AI talk seems quite far away, why people still get hacked by a malicious link. I like to think about paradigm changes. And what I mean by this is we saw that WannaCry and NotPetya were paradigm changes. We knew that ransomware existed and we knew that laterally moving malware existed, but nobody had put it together. And these two things coming together really changed the landscape of security and still does. And we anticipate the same happening once the genie is out of the bottle with offensive AI. So introducing some clever machine learning to some phases of the attack lifecycle to hacking. So it's early to say, but something folks should think about because we think it's a strategic topic. All right, Joe, what do you think? I think that was a great interview, Dave. I like what Max had to say. A couple key points here. I like his term fearware. That's a great Hmm. term. Remember, we said this earlier in the show, but fear is a tool that scammers use to short circuit your thinking. It's one of the biggest tools that they have. The other tool being greed. Those are the two things that they use, fear and greed. They also use loneliness, love, isolation, other tools as well. But for setting the hook, the two biggest emotional triggers they're going to capitalize on are fear and greed. So Mm. when someone's trying to scare you via email, slow down, relax. An attacker inserting themselves into an email conversation by compromising an email account strikes me as a great way to get the target to open your malicious attachment. If you think about this, getting an email from somebody going, hey, take a look at this attachment, you're immediately like, "Uh, no, no, I'm not going to take a look at that attachment, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're in a conversation with somebody and they go, oh, by the way, here, I found this. Why don't you look at it? Your guard may be down, especially if they're coming from a compromised inbox. Right. It's a trusted source. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. If if I got an email from you that said, hey, Dave, check out this uh, thing I saw. This is hilarious. Right. I'd probably just open it up because I consider you to be a trusted source and I wouldn't think twice about it. Absolutely. Fool that I am. (laughs) Right. Well, fortunately for you, Dave, I use multi-factor authentication on all the email accounts I use to uh, communicate with you. So the chances of that account being hacked by uh, somebody else are very low. Okay. Lucky you. (laughs) Machine learning is the future of security, but it is also the future of malicious activity. That is definitely going to be out there. These machine learning tools are readily available for anybody. They are developed in, in Python, which is a language that's very easy to learn and pick up. And if you all you have to do is just start learning about it and you can develop these tools. And of course, malicious actors know that and they're doing it as well. Darktrace has used machine learning to automate the recon phase of a social engineering attack. And once again, here's some more wild speculation from me. Darktrace said they are not going to release their tool because they think it's too dangerous, but someone is going to release something similar. In fact, Max was talking about one tool that already does this for Twitter accounts, but somebody's going to release something similar like what they've developed. And I would suspect that there are already organizations that have similar tools, uh, malicious organizations. Yeah, for sure. Max talks about things early in the kill chain being difficult to defend against. And if you're not familiar with the term kill chain, you know, that's one of those sexy computer security terms, right? We got to get them in somewhere along the kill chain. Uh The process of performing any kind of malicious activity is just that. It's a process, right? And it starts with recon and, and surveillance, and then it moves along this process. And the first kinetic action is usually an email. And then after that, there's a malicious installation of some software or a compromise of a machine. Then after that, there's lateral movement. And that's the list of opportunities that you have to stop this attack. And they call that the the kill chain. So it's Mm. a nice, concise way to explain that. Uh, And he's right. Defending against the recon part is really not that easy. I mean, because all that information is out there. And Mm -hmm. as Max is talking, he makes me want to just get rid of all my social media accounts, right? Which is something I already want to do, but I can't. But then he says something that's really interesting. And that's if you're not there, somebody's going to fill that void with you. That's a risk that you're running. And again, we we see that with you. You've shut down your your Facebook account and your Instagram account, and somebody has filled that void, that Dave Bittner void that was in my Instagram followers. (laughs) So, <laughs> thankfully now thanks to this malicious actor i have that dave bittner void filled. yes yes that's right you had a dave bittner shaped hole in your heart <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> all right well our thanks to max heinemeyer from dark trace for joining us uh, we do appreciate him taking the time 
And of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. We want to thank all of you for listening. That is our show. Of course, we want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.